Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Data, Data Trust Salon series hosted by the Ostrom Workshop. My name is Andrew Raymond, and today we have a note from Mozilla, who's going to speak to us about an pro interesting project that they're doing at Mozilla, as well as some opportunities and some prior research that she's done. So thank you. Feel free to begin. Hello. Thank you, um, Angie. That's a great introduction. Um, and thank you, Richard, for taking over for me for a bit. Um, so it's my understanding you already know quite a bit about Data Futures Lab at this point. Um, and actually what I wanted to do today is have a conversation rather than me doing a whole bunch of presenting um, and basically kind of start that conversation at the point where I am at right now in my own kind of research and working on data trust. Um, and kind of, I have like a whole t a ton of questions that I've been pondering and I would love to just think on those with you. I uh, have a couple of slides that I will now go find. There they are. Let's see. There we go. Yes, so we're gonna be talking about data trust, which should come to no surprise. Um, just for a little bit of background, I have been working with the Mozilla Foundation, as Angie has already mentioned, um, on data trust, on data stewardship, on data governance, on any kind of governance model related to data. There are too many words to keep track of at this point. Um, but within the Mozilla Foundation, um, what I'm focusing on right now is to kind of figure out how we can learn from all the various experiments we are doing in this area. Because there's been a lot of thinking, um, but I think we're finally getting to the stage where we're just, um, yeah, getting. To do, to do the work and experiment with various concepts. And as we are doing that, I, yeah, for me, the interest is really like, how can we learn from each other? How do we avoid having 100,000 experiments around the world that are all learning the same lesson at the same time? How can we speed up that learning a little bit? Um, and yeah, I, I do this with kind of Ostrom's design principles in mind and trying to figure out like, instead of just looking at those principles as like, ambitions or goals, really figuring out like, how do we even start tackling those? And as different organizations are starting to tackle them, um, like how can we learn from their approaching in, approaches in starting to tackling, tackle the design principles? I know that's a mouthful, uh, but that's roughly what I'm working on within the Mozilla Foundation, as well as just some um, basic coordination of projects, et cetera. Um, but then, Alongside that, I started an organization called Digital Commoners, um, where I really hope to do a whole lot of peer learning. So uh, Digital Commoners is focused on anyone with building digital commons, data commons, digital commons, knowledge commons. I, I'm, I don't want to discriminate too much. A lot of these organizations are dealing with similar governance problems. And so um, I wanted to get away from just having endless panels and actually having conversations between people who are building the things. Um, so yeah, and then I just started that. Uh, we've kind of been growing a community, but the idea there is that uh, often when it comes to data governance, we talk about it in terms of like, especially within companies, it gets talked about in terms of like the management systems of data and, but the actual government governance, like the who gets to make decisions comes last and that's everywhere. That's in funder proposals, um, and that's often when we start building these tools. And so I'm hoping that by growing this community, the thing itself, like the governance itself becomes a thing rather than an afterthought. So that's a bit of what I'm working on and the perspectives I bring into this. Um, I am gonna do an annoying thing where I'm very, very quickly, I'm gonna walk through data trust so that I know that we're all on the same page and we're not, we don't end up talking about uh, different things, but I also know that this is month four or five um, of this working group. So I'm sorry if I'm repeating like a hundred things other people have already said before me. Um, but very, very broadly, what I think data trusts are, what I mean when I talk about data trusts are data governance models that are rooted in trust law. Um, so just like any other trust, they have trustees and those trustees have a fiduciary duty to act on behalf of the beneficiaries of the trust and the trust has a specific purpose. Um, now I'll go into that a bit more, but for now, just why I think they're very useful is 
three main reasons and there's a hundred thousand other different reasons but the main one for me is the main ones for me are um, mission log so that what, what happens right now often is you'll have companies promising you to behave nicely uh, and then two years later either they change their minds because they need to make more money uh, they get pushed by investors um, they obviously have a fiduciary duty to make a profit so um, when they, they need to act in accordance or they get bought and a new company decides that they don't care as much as about privacy for instance or governance of the platform uh, as the original company did and so data trust can act as a way to achieve mission luck where you say well our mission is to be privacy aware and to never collect your phone number or to never collect um, the actual messages you send or or like the social your social graph will collect it but we never do anything with it beyond using it so you can use a social media platform um, instead of us trusting that platform and that company we could trust a data trust um, with a mission to um, like a data trust that has a fiduciary duty to fulfill that mission um, then there's the collective action piece which is really me against a large social media platform is almost certainly going to lose but if we group a whole bunch of people together we will have a stronger voice except that in that case unless we're all going to make all the decisions all the time and we're going to vote on everything we may want someone quote unquote in charge acting on our behalf with our best interests at heart uh, because they have a fiduciary duty um, who can um, advocate on our behalf and also execute our wishes while we can continuously trust uh, that they will do what is in our best interest um, and the third one is like a broad category i see um, is data pooling um, sort of the reverse of or like the flip side of collective action where instead of saying we'll bundle our rights um, to collectively stand up for them we say hey let's put our data together uh, or even not just the existing data but decide ourselves what we want to collect and what we find useful and the questions we want to ask of the data and pull that and make that useful for us as a community or um, there's so many different situations, or like our collective health, et cetera. Um, and so those types of data pools, again, unless we're all going to be involved in the daily running of them, most likely they will have some people ex um, executing our wishes and desires and acting on our behalf. And again, a data trust is a kind of a neat way to ensure that they do that um, with our interests at heart. Um, I'm currently working on a version of data pooling, which is um, in a bunch of community houses in San Francisco where people have started to do research on themselves. Um, so this is sort of in the realm of citizen science. Um, and at the moment, it's mostly survey based. So people either ask it, like scientists within that community um, will start experiments or start surveys to ask people questions and then and, and try to figure out long-term trends i'm keeping it vague because the content of those services can vary wildly um, there's also a whole bunch of experiments to see how group behavior changes um, given different um, prompts or different environmental settings um, but the thing with that kind of data and not just the underlying data but also the experiments themselves in the wrong hands they can obviously be used to nudge groups which is not the intention of the um of the experiment it's really done by a group of people to understand themselves better and to um kind of work towards collective goals if anything um and so it's really important there that the data is held by the community that the community continuously has control over that data um and can at a later point maybe decide to give others access as well. So we're looking into data trust for that specific purpose. Um, so it, it's also in that context, I'm asking a lot of the questions that I will uh, consider next. Um, oh yeah, I, I think I basically covered this, but the key elements are of a data trust are these fiduciary duties I mentioned, the fact that there are beneficiaries, and this is I think a key element because um, there are quite a few quote unquote data trusts popping up where it's essentially companies sharing data between each other and the beneficiaries of the trust are not the people the data is about or the communities who are affected by the data, but the companies collecting the data. 
And when I talk about a data trust, I usually not include that as part of the example. Um, and then the other thing is specific purpose. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, the more specific, the better, because that also allows you to say, hey, this uh, trustee is not acting in my best interest within the context of this purpose. And if that purpose get really broad, that's a little harder to argue. So um, that I think is a key element as well. Now, um, the questions I have been pondering uh, are largely related to all the various failure modes I am imagining at the moment. Um, and, and these are definitely not all of them. These are just the ones that I'm, I find most um, pressing. Uh, and the first one is, is the one that I always get asked whenever I give a talk about data trust. It's like, what if the trustees are corrupt or start, or more likely uh, are just underperforming? Like, very often people aren't evil, they are just negligent, um, and trustees may be that. Um, now the fiduciary duties include duties of uh, care and um, duties of loyalty. However, it could very well be that this is going on, like trustees are not acting in our best interests or not doing their job properly, may not take enough care to, for instance, if they also hold the data to secure the data. Like there's a lot of scenarios uh, where things may have gone wrong, and we may not know about it. Um, and so while we have a legal right to intervene and to be like, hey, trustee, you should be replaced, um, we may not do it because we simply don't know um, or the wrong people know. Or So it, ultimately this comes down to transparency and I'm trying to figure out like what are some measures we can implement um, that guarantee more transparency and guarantee that people start acting when things go wrong in a timely manner rather than after a year when the wrong going is is kind of so far that all your data is already sitting with a data broker right that's not what we want um the other one is the the risk of lock-in um we talk about a lot about being locked into the facebook's and being locked into other social medias um and and so kind of a natural question that comes up here is will people then be locked in to their data trust um, and the reason that is an important one is that um, especially if you combine it with the underperforming trustees so the trustee may still be sort of performing okay but maybe not as okay as you would want it to um, so you may not want to go all the way to court yet um, but you're in a situation where you cannot leave the data trust this seems unlikely. It seems likely that you should be able to leave the data trust, but that still creates new problems because um, you may, like, we may all be technically and legally be able to use to leave the data trust that we are a part of, um, but we may not do it, and um, simply because the act of like either taking our data out or taking our interests out of it or whatever is in it, taking that with us and and going. A different way, um, maybe simply too cumbersome for most of us to do it. Like the most ardent uh, privacy advocates, or the most like the people who care most probably will, uh, but everyone else may still be stuck in the data trust. And actually, that ends up ends us up in a worse situation because now all the people who care less but are still being hurt um, are kind of stuck while well, everyone who cares and would open their mouth and make a whole fuss is now gone somewhere else. So, and that's a problem that shows up in a lot of our um, digital life. I mean, in a lot of our life generally, but in a lot of our digital life as well, it's like, um, we may not like that Google is spying on us whenever we send an email through Gmail and yet most of us are still locked into Gmail, even though we could leave, right? So this is, it's not, yeah, not an uncommon problem. Um, Another one that's, again, these are all very related, um, but another one for me is unequal access to justice. Like we may have the right to replace one trustee with another, but not all of us have the ability to just go to court and, um, and make use of that right. Um, so what does that mean? Does that mean that we need yet another set of institutions to hold this institution to account and actually take it to court if time comes? Um, or does that mean that we at least have some people who have access to justice who fight on behalf of others, which creates all sorts of power dynamics? Should we just, with the data trust itself, ensure access to justice and make the resources available? Um, these are unanswered questions as far as I'm concerned, but I think they are important ones. Um, 
then there is the self-exploitation thing. And I get asked this question a lot as well. It's like, well, if you build a data trust and all the, and then everyone in it um, needs money, um, can you start creating data sets and then selling access to that data set, even if it hurts the beneficiaries, because it may hurt them in their, like on their, on the end, on their kind of power dynamic privacy end of the spectrum, but they may need income just to pay rent. So what we end up with, um, like, yeah, where as an individual, when you monetize your data, this sort of self-exploitation is very apparent. This may also happen on the level of a data trust, especially if that data trust needs money to be financially sustainable and continue existing. Like that you do create, even if it doesn't have a, a fiduciary duty to make a profit, you create some sort of tension there, especially because organizations that are in existence tend to want to stay in existence. Since they tend to want, they are tend to be motivated towards survival. So, how do we offset that dynamic? Um, I know it's a long list, but I'm almost there. Um, the last one is minority or majority or minority interest role, um, and this is basically what we see in democracies, right? It's like, how do we ensure that? Because take one step back, um, all the beneficiaries of a data trust may not have the same interest. They may have roughly the same interest. Um, like the one I'm working on right now, there are a whole bunch of people who happily participate in all this research. Um, they want to have their data collected because it is well communal and they actually trust each other in an actual way as well. Um, but they are also very different human beings. And they may ultimately, if we start to get to a second stage where we're like, oh, we under certain conditions would like to make our data available to some actors, but not others. Um, there may be a lot of difference in a, of opinion uh, within the group of beneficiaries. Um, and so how do we avoid that a small vocal minority uh, captures kind of the, the policies of the data trusts? Or conversely, that a large majority captures, uh, like wins the vote at the expense of a, a small majority minority that may be uh, impacted way worse than the majority, like the negative impact on the minority may be way worse than the positive impact on the majority, for instance, or like, yes, these things don't necessarily need to be in balance. Um, obviously, this is a question that democracies grapple with as well. And so we can um, learn a little bit from, from that experience. Um, but I think it's an important one to keep in mind and figure out. Um, so these are the things that I would like to discuss. Um, I, I created a whole other long list because that's what I've been doing. I've been creating lists, um, but um, basically flipping the failure modes, the potential failure modes into questions. And the questions really are like, who are the trustees? Like if you look at, if you think about a data trust and you think about people in charge, either making decisions or executing decisions, what kind of skills do those people need to have? Um, should they all be lawyers? Should they absolutely never be lawyers? Um, what kind of technical skills do we expect from them? What kind of social skills? Because it's probably going to involve a lot of kind of diplomacy and figuring out different interests with different groups. Like, how are we thinking about that? Um, and then there's questions of like, how are decisions made within the trust? Because we could assume trustees take all the decisions, but we can easily assume that there are some collective decisions taken by the beneficiaries of the trust. Like it could be a slightly more democratic model. The trustees don't have to act as benevolent dictators. Um, what happens like related to all the many failure modes, what happens when the quality of decisions taken or the execution of those decisions goes down? Uh, who can then challenge the trustees? Um, but also how are disputes mediated? Because not every dispute, dispute amounts to like um, the trustee acting against their fiduciary duty. Sometimes people just disagree. And so what kind of institutions are we thinking about setting up to, um, and what can we learn from other examples in different spaces for setting up uh, kind of dispute resolution systems? So like I said, there's a whole whole bunch of questions that I'm uh, trying to work through and I know it's a lot um, but I know there's a whole bunch of smart people in this room so I'm basically just using all your collective intelligence to try to answer some of these questions. Um, I kind of want to both leave these questions up and also be able to do other things with my Zoom. Um, Chris 
Chris already has a question, so this is great. Go, Chris. I've got a ton of questions. I love this, but I'll, I'll limit it to two to right now. I guess one clarifying and one, I guess, more prodding. The, the first one clarifying is, are, are we making distinctions in these questions between data, data sets, and information? And the second one being, um, with regards to self-exploitation, which is one I've been very curious about often, because uh, like, for example, how are disputes mediated in, in the one that we built with respect to uh, intellectual property for the purpose of business creation, our end hook was you can take your data and go home. Uh, and so you can actually pull that out, but that data was a distinct packet, right? And the right. level of information built around it now becomes fuzzy. And it was, you know, the, the intent was it, you were so bundled and tied together that you were going to be forced to resolve because the take my ball and go home kills value for everyone. However, it brings up the self-exploitation, and I'm sorry, I, I will keep this brief. The self-exploitation one, um, would Kim Kardashian be considered self-exploiting? And should be should should she be allowed to do that? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Um, I would think Kim Kardashian holds quite a bit of power, so I'm like, hmm. but um, but that's a it's a good point. Uh, like, how much do we allow self exploitation? Um, also, self exploitation is in the eye of the beholder a little bit. Um, and are there limits to it? Where we just say never that. Um, to your first question, yeah, I wonder, so there are definitely different consideration depending on the resource that is governed by the data trust. So if we are talking about raw data, that's different. And, and I think to your second point, like we can be talking about raw data that's very, that identifies individuals and they have an actual right over versus um, data that is about other things or that is aggregated so it doesn't identify human individuals anymore. Um, and obviously, depending on what the resource is, it's gonna be easier or harder for people to remove themselves and take the data with them. Um, and then you could even think that if they, they may be able to remove themselves, take some of the data with them, and it could still be that some of the insights from that data are still show up in the aggregated data set. In that case, should their interest, even if they are not an active member anymore, should their interest still be taken into account when uh, the data is made available to others? Um, so, yeah, it's a can of worms, essentially. Um, well, that's this has we... to end up again. Oh, I'm sorry. I was meant to No, down, it's okay. Is, is a quick... I, I would love for this to be a conversation, so jump in. Well, as, as a follow-up to that, that was our that last piece, because I would say we, we have a piece of data, which I guess there's questions whether or not it itself can be owned. There's the data set, and what we would consider the data set and how we were implementing this was essentially if you make a marketing plan for what is an intended venture, you own that marketing plan, and you're essentially loaning it to that venture, which is which in our framing of this would become the information. So the company is the information, the, the venture is the information, the marketing plan is the data set, which you would have ownership of. And then if you basically say, okay, we're gonna pull this data set out, nothing that was built upon that data set could be used, which would essentially kill the information right. you gain. Um, I'm curious if that same model is there. And to the Kim Kardashian one, uh, as uh, Hootie and the Blowfish uh, eloquently put, with big money comes big bills. So I wonder if exploitation actually has a, a limit or if it's always uh, right. rolling. Um, yeah, I think it, so. One of the questions I didn't list here is what kind of assets can we even put in a data trust? Um, and I kind of didn't want to go into that because. That's a whole legal conversation. Um, but generally, as kind of a heuristic, I've been treating data donation or data, um, like making data available to for others to build something on top of, a little like organ donation, like think long and hard. But once you do it and they do the thing of building something on top of the data, there's no reversing that. Um, and that's mostly a practical argument. Um, but we'd love to hear from other people as well. I think uh, Greg had a question. 
I can see the chat, which is endlessly annoying. So I just get rid of the slides. Let's do I that. Can, I can ask it also that's better for video recording Great. purposes. Um, so going right into the weeds, I've heard very different uh, interpretations of like the configuration of what a trust would be and what the components are. And maybe these reflect differences internationally and in what trust law is and how that works. Um, but I've heard like one formulation of a trust in which a trustee is a member of like the, the, the governing group of trustees and like the trustees make the decisions, right, about what can happen. And I've heard a very different formulation in which a trustee is maybe uh, an empowered appropriator, essentially, right, a, a licensee, essentially, um, who, like a vendor, like a technology vendor, who is given privileges by the trust and whose behaviors is monitored and constrained by the trust and can be removed as a trustee. Um, so those are two very different configurations. Uh, you know, maybe they're both trying to approach the same ends, but um, uh, as I'm trying to socialize this idea, uh, I'm finding the, the abstraction of it is a challenge and getting clearer on what are some patterns for the different kinds of roles um, uh, would, would be super helpful. And maybe this, this contradiction is just like naturally going to emerge, you know, what is what, or maybe we actually want to try to clarify one thing or another. I don't know. So, yes, I, I know what you mean. <laughs> there is, um, I think, actually quite a lot of people when they talk about data trust assume that the trustees are going to make all the decisions, um, which still leaves the question, like, even if they ultimately decide, it's like, how do they know, like, if it's deciding in, in about something that's supposedly in my best interest, is that purely paternalistic where they just also infer what that might be? Or could I maybe give some hints as to what my best interest might look like? Um, and that, and it's obviously, if you look at trusts that hold money, this question a lot easier because the best interest is very simple, make more money. Um, but with data that gets complicated, the model, I personally like, but this is just one among many flavors, is the community land trust. Um, so in a community land trust, the trust holds land, as the name suggests, um, and that land is, um, and then on that land, people live in houses and they own their houses, but they don't own the land that's underneath it, and that helps. And, and so the purpose of the trust is usually to keep the price of the land low so that people, so there's like low income housing. Um, but it's not just the trustees. So the way decisions work, there's three boards. There's one board of people living in those houses, so the residents. Um, but usually that land is, is more than just um, the street the houses are on. So it's a larger community. So there's another board that's made up of the community members and a third board that's made up of city officials, usually some version of lawyers and politicians. And each board has equal votes. So this is a sort of a, ultimately sort of a representative um, democracy model, but with more specific interest groups already represented in the governance model. I don't think it's the only version. It's interesting because what I don't understand about this model and I would like to understand is whether those boards are actually the trustees or whether the trustees are the people. I cannot for the life of me figure out. Um, one lawyer I talked to seemed to think that those people are the trustees. Um, and at which point I was like, how is it possible for the beneficiaries to also act as trustees? Um, and apparently there's some loophole, but she has yet to tell me what that loophole is, um, because that would make for a very interesting model, I think. Has anyone come across this question? I think Richard may have some, but I don't want to, again, put you <laughs> on the spot. Sadia, did you have a question or do you, can I ask another? Wasn't sure if you were unmuting. No, I was just thinking I might have had a very questionable, puzzled look on my face, maybe, but um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> now I'm personally like interested in how um, how personalization, how personalization of information works like and how that's used for targeting. So like if I if an individual's data um, is used to create a, you know, a, a picture of themselves that's used used for targeting. And then if a data trust holds 
um, holds that person's data as an, a whole entity, but where people have um, different, um, like different interest within their, you know, within information about themselves of, of how it's used. Um, um, like would would the idea of a a person be able to be is it better for it to be distributed among data trusts so like if a data trust one of them um, is has values around a certain thing and they put certain data in that one or if all of their data is in one does it make it easier to target them um, those are the kinds of things that I was thinking about if that's a if that's a legitimate question. I think it's a legitimate question. It's a question I don't ask her often because we are so far away from reaching a world where your data can sit in multiple data trusts. Um, but that doesn't make it an invalid question. It's a very good one, actually. Um, and I'm thinking I had a conversation with Sylvie de la Croix, who has spoken in this, uh, who is, I think, did the first session. Um, and she found a model for data trusts or for trusts in general where. Um, the, the way the assets, the data or the data rights would be put in the trust, and this is really as, as much as I understand this, um, would basically imply that you can only do that, you can only put your data rights in one trust and not also in a whole bunch of others. And that seems to imply that you don't need to have sub trusts. So you, because um, you cannot put it in multiple, so you could have like a one big overarching trust and then all these little small trusts underneath uh, that handle your data with specific purposes attached. Um, I'm not sure from like a technical point of view, that seems like a horrible idea. Uh, from a legal point of view, that may be a great idea. So um, I think basically what I'm trying to say is there's a lot to figure out, um, but I would love to hear from other people who have thoughts on this because these are definitely the questions. Richard has his hand up. Ah, well, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I think um, Sylvie has talked about sort of an ecosystem of trusts, um, ideally, right, or optimally, that there are different trusts with, for example, you know, health, finance, natural resources, whatever sort of the the gravita, the the, uh, the aspect of it that people want to you know collectivize around. So I think that makes a lot of sense to me, but also suggests lots of fragmentation and even confusion on the part of people who want to become part of the trusts, right? So one of the theses I've been positing is that. Uh, and particularly in, I would say, more individualized cultures like the Western world, um, that people at least initially may want a fiduciary or an entity that represents them, that in turn can help them figure out which trust to join based on, you know, all the different degrees of things you already talked about, right? All, all that, <laughs> is this the kind of trust for me in terms of subject matter? Do they have the right kind of governance structure that I'm interested in? Do I want to be part of it? Um, and the governance, you know, actually uh, helping to, to run it. Um, so that anyway, that's more of a comment than I guess a question, but it, um, it seems like it, it, if it works, then there'll be a, a plethora of them. Um, but that also then the, that multiplication means also more challenge in terms of how you get your arms around it as from the average person's perspective and in terms of actually becoming an active participant. That's right. I also wonder as well, I mean, I, you know, and apologies, I'm not a lawyer by origin. So some of these, I, you know, um, the the issue of the trust being one item like land trusts, right? Or the because I wonder if the correct corollary is a land trust, or is the correct corollary a uh, you know a, a donation piece, or is really um, because the beauty of data, I think, if I'm thinking about, it, is number one, it's infinitely replicable. It's infinitely replicable without degradation, as long as you can validate originality and authenticity. Um, but the second piece is, I wonder, is, is there, and this is, I guess, I, is there anything that you can possibly build with data where there is a, a moral obligation not to break it and rebuild it? Like in a human, I get the organ, I get the organ donation thing, right? It's like, okay, I've donated a liver. I'm not going to go take the liver out, right? I think Shakespeare had some thoughts on this too, right? So I'm not going to go take the organ back out, but if I have a piece of data that's instrumental to the construction of that information set, and my last recourse is portability, and I break the information set, 
I could still rebuild that information set with another element and that information set could do something else. Is there anything that actually morally exists where I can't break the information set and, and it isn't just a cost impact versus a, because you're not killing a person theoretically. I guess that's a question. Is there anything that we would end up killing someone or harming someone irreparably as opposed to just be a monetary element, which again, seems to push this argument that I should have multiple pools more than I should have a solitary trust that creates this, you know, this, this sort of moral, I can't back out of position. I don't know about moral examples, but the only thing that comes to mind is um, medical research. Like if you become part of a trial and you do the whole trial, you cannot go back five years later and be like, oh, could you pull my data? Especially not that data is used for uh, long, uh, longevity studies or not longevity, like time series studies, uh, where we wanna know like 20 years from now, how the situation has changed with you. Um, well, but what if the benefits of that doesn't work? Well, what if what if you're talking about you know African American sickle cell sickle cell research, right? And you do want to cause harm due to the inequitable implementation of that study, and you do want to say, you know what, I'm going to pull my data out, and because of that, I have to break the results and break the profitability of those results, and therefore that group is going to have to go back and figure out a way to reassemble their data and force them into the market to identify, okay, yeah, we know we really, and we know we killed your grandpa. So this is the amount of money we're willing to pay to reassemble this data set to be able to make sure it's allowed to, to exist within medical. Maybe, maybe that is the bargaining piece you're looking for. I mean, even in those pieces, right? There's a cost to reassembly, but right. is, is there ever, I mean, we lose information in society all the time. Is there actually really a moral imperative that we don't have to rebuild the information set we built? So I think there's two sides to this. There's the reassembling of the data set so that people can um, use it for research. And there is the, we had a data set, your data was part of it. Based on the data set, we had insights. Um, and you cannot unlearn what you learned, sort of. Like some of it becomes almost impossible. Like you can pull your data from that data set, at least technically. Um, and then the data set changed. And yes, in order to make use of it in the future, you would then have to uh, do something to it um, or like add new data to it. Or, But the insights obtained from the research that you participated in, or for instance, the artificial intelligence trained on that data um, is now trained. So I'm, I'm wondering, and in my opinion, that should be that way. Um, which is why we need to be careful with our decisions. Um, but are you, so like, how far would you want this to go? Would you want it to go all the way to like the end point or just in the data set itself? Yeah, you know, I guess, you know, the artificial intelligence one, I think is the, the interesting one is where my mind goes to this, right? I mean, right now we're mistraining artificial intelligence because the data sets are bad, right? I mean, like we see this in the legal tech situation all the time. We, 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 are, we, are, we are training AI to learn off of fundamentally systemically inequitable systems. I don't think necessarily the loss of the training is a big harm. In fact, that'd probably be a good. So I guess the question is in that system, you know, we can, you know, we already have right to be forgotten laws, right? right. I mean, Google still knows I exist. It theoretically isn't able to train forward based on that other element that it should have forgotten, even though we can argue whether it does. Um, and so I guess I, you know, I think the fact that AI is a driver in some senses almost seems to be an, an argument that we can do it. It isn't, you know, the, these, are no, these, these results are no longer static. Um, they are continually optimizing. So I, I feel like now we're seeing less harm from the idea of saying, I'm gonna take my ball and go home. And if it's really that important, you know, make sure the compensation is in line with what that individual believes is valuable so long as it doesn't end up with a fundamentally power imbalanced exploitation situation. So, and I, I, these aren't definitive answers. I, I know I speak definitively. These are sort of more open-ended questioning. So sorry, I'm, I'm working on that. <laughs> but. No, I, I mean, I think they're all excellent questions. And Richard's point here of um, like, 
yeah, who owns the derivatives of the data. At some point, I tried to figure out what the kind of license would look like where you could say, um, yes, you can use my data, but whatever product you build on top of it needs to be available to everyone or needs to be available just to me or needs to be, or you can make commercial profit of it. Like, is there any way to license not the, just the data, but anything done on top of the data? A little bit like free software, um, like propagates through whatever is built on top of it. Um, but, and I'm gonna say your name horribly wrong, but uh, Pruett, you had a question as well, and we're almost out of time. You are muted and maybe you don't want to ask your question. Oh, thank you so much. There we um, go. Uh, I have uh, some question about the uh, uh, digital governance. Uh, in my country, we have a National Institute of the Statistics that uh, they are working on the data governance but I, I just curious that um, how different between uh, the duty of the central government, uh, central government and local government and nonprofit organization like uh, digital commoners like like you did. I just uh, uh, I just curious this issue. Thank you. Right, I think that's a good question. Um, I would love a lawyer's opinion about this as well. My general sense is that if we build, so there was a proposal in India a while back um, to do data trusts, um, but then have the local government act as a trustee, um, which to me seemed like a gross conflict of interest uh, because the local government also had an interest in the data. Um, so that was the first thing that came to mind. Um, more generally, like uh, government, government officials have a duty towards, this, at least in democracies, towards the, the citizens um, they are working on behalf of. Um, but that's the, that seems to be a lot less enforced or a lot less, um, like not as specifically um, tied to a purpose as a data trust uh, duty, and therefore the, yeah, would be um, a nonprofit. I just read a whole article, this is my only knowledge of it, so correct me, Richard. Um, but I just read a whole article about nonprofits and the um, the people, the, the trustees of the nonprofits, uh, even though a nonprofit doesn't need to be a trust, but the, um, the people sitting on the board also have fiduciary duties towards the members of the nonprofit, usually, uh, or the beneficiaries of a charitable nonprofit. Um, but those are also differently enforced from what I can tell than, um, than the trustees of a trust. Uh, but Richard, I'm gonna let you jump in because fiduciaries are your thing. And yeah. also, yes. Now, um, yeah. I know we're Everyone, also on time, but real quickly, yeah, there's some yeah. scholars some scholars who suggest that um, policy people who are elected, elected officials owe a fiduciary duty to us as citizens. But ironically, that's not the case. In fact, the president of the United States owes us nothing basically once, they're, once he or she is in office. So. Um, but that's something that there is an attempt to try to import some of the fiduciary thinking, not only in that situation, but also for international human rights situations that people who are you know, being persecuted, for example, or minorities within their governments have a right to have those elected officials or semi-elected officials treat them uh, under fiduciary duty obligations. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, Jess, uh, just so you know, we... Uh, we were on uh, daylight savings time, so we started an hour earlier than you probably thought. Um, but uh, it, this uh, session was recorded and we will make it available. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so thank you everyone <laughs> for participating. Um, I, th I think those were some really good questions. Um, and I, I, I kind of like this format. It, it made it very interesting with people being able to contribute. Um, so we will see you next month. Um, we have two more sessions scheduled, April and May. Um, and have a, have a great, uh, great month till I see you next. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I thank you everyone for participating and having a great conversation. Thank you. Bye. Bye.